Hi, I'm Pippa Malmgren, and I'm a senior advisor to Real Vision Television and a former presidential advisor, and now I advise big institutional investors. And I'm particularly interested in the questions involving politics, policy, geopolitics, which are very important today. The subject at hand is the Italian referendum, which is on December the 4th. And I have the opportunity today to interview Professor Onida, who was the head of the Italian Constitutional Court and a great expert on the legal questions at stake in the Italian referendum, and also Rodolfo de Benedetti, who is a very prominent uh, investor in Italy. And we're going to listen to these two men to try to understand what's going to happen with the Italian referendum. International observers, I think, have very simplistic ideas about your referendum. Could you just explain what the referendum is about? This is a referendum that has for object the approval or the non approval of a law of reform of the Constitution, of revision of the Constitution, which has diversi punti, che cioè cambia la Costituzione in diversi punti, però la Costituzione è italiana, non ha nessun riflesso sulla posizione internazionale dell'Italia. I punti su cui verte la modifica sono diversi, vari, e riguardano la struttura e il modo di operare del Parlamento, riguardano i rapporti fra lo Stato e le regioni, riguardano il modo in cui è eletto il Presidente della Repubblica, in cui sono eletti i giudici della Corte Costituzionale eh, e riguarda diverse altre eh, materie. T tanto è che alcuni studiosi e osservatori in Italia, tra cui io, abbiamo rilevato che un voto ref di referendum su una legge così complessa e con una molteplicità di oggetti non omogenei rischia di eh, ledere la libertà di voto degli elettori. Dell'elettore. Quindi abbiamo anche chiesto che si possa arrivare a, 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 si possa in, chiedere alla Corte Costituzionale di pronunciarsi su questo fatto, se è davvero un unico referendum con un unico quesito a cui si può dare una unica risposta, o sì o no, vada bene in un caso di questo genere. E posso aggiungere che il, il rischio in questo modo è che si trasformi questo referendum in un, come si dice, plebiscito o in una questione popolare di fiducia nelle forze politiche che hanno voluto queste modifiche della Costituzione. I find it interesting, I think international observers really can't even comprehend how does the economy work now and how might it work differently if we see this referendum passed. Could you talk to that a little bit? Well, let, let me start to say that that you know, I, I travel quite extensively, and I and I spend a good part of my time outside of Italy. And I've been very surprised in the last few months to see how this uh, uh, deadline of uh, this Italian constitutional referendum has become important. Uh, the the fact that you're here to talk to me about it is is a sign of it. Um, and. Uh, um, you know, I think it's an indication of the fact that <laughs> reforms uh, are badly needed in this country uh, since a long time. And I think that the lack of them has caused this country to underperform uh, its uh, uh, you know, main trading partners in Europe since a very long time. We're talking about maybe 20 years. And uh, I think when the current prime minister uh, took office uh, about two and a half years ago, um, this was taken as um, a promise of change and reform. And uh, I think it was probably the first time in many years that a lot of hopes, um, a lot of expectations <coughs> were built uh, on a politician and on a government um, since many, many years. Um, the, uh, the change in the Constitution is one of those reforms. Uh, it's probably not the most concrete and visible one for uh, individuals, for consumers or for investors, um, but it is an important one and it is a, a, an overdue one. And, uh, 
The fact that uh, you know the present government and and our prime minister has um, put such an emphasis and such an importance on it, on it, I think is 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 a testament to um, you know how important this is and. And the fact that the world sees this Italian referendum today as, uh, you know, one of those important watershed dates in, in Europe over the next few months um, is because it is seen, rightly or wrongly, as a symbol of, uh, you know, is this country reformable or not? Is this happening in Italy or not? Are those changes that people have been talking about and expecting for many years, um, are, are, is this the right time? And so uh, I think, unfortunately, as, as it happens oftentimes with referendums, um, then votes take a, a, their own dynamic and people s start, you know, to, uh, to side on, you know, one side or the other and uh, they forget about the issue. They forget about why, what is it they're voting on. And basically it becomes a personal uh, endorsement or not for an individual or for a government which is exactly what is happening in Italy. So the, the Italian debate uh, you know, is not so much or is very marginally about what are we talking about, what is this reform about, but it is more you know, we are for Renzi or against Renzi. And, and that's it, which, which clearly I think is a distortion of, uh, of the vote because uh, I think it's a pity because people should be much more informed and, inf and, 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 and concerned about what is it that they're called to vote on. And, um, but I think, it's a, I think it's an important uh, date. I think it's an important um, uh, you know, point in time for, for the country. Actually, I, you know, I'm, I'm not used to talk about Italian politics, but I, I think uh, you know, it's probably worth making an exception here because uh, exactly because of this, you know, huge expectation that there is particularly outside of Italy and, and, and this idea that uh, you know, if, the, if the referendum were to end up with a no vote, this would be the end of it. Now, I think this is much too exaggerated. I think uh, the referendum is an opportunity for change. Uh, I think it's basically um, you know, a vote for change versus conservatism. The financial markets seem to believe that a no vote would be a disaster for Italy. Do you think that's true? Or are there any other paths to success, to reform? Che ci sare, sarebbe un disastro la vittoria del no, come non sarebbe un disastro neanche la vittoria del sì. È soltanto l'approvazione, non l'approvazione, di, 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 di un cambiamento in alcuni aspetti della Costituzione. Nella nostra storia ne abbiamo fatti tanti di cambiamenti. Eh, 18 modifiche della Costituzione sono state approvate negli anni trascorsi. L'ultima modifica è stata approvata nel 2012 per introdurre il principio del pareggio di bilancio nella Costituzione. E una riforma importante è stata fatta nel 2001 sui rapporti fra Stato e Regioni. Quindi non è vero che se questa riforma non passa non si potrà fare nessun'altra riforma, nessun'altra modifica della Costituzione. In ogni caso io penso che i problemi italiani non sono di cambiare, quelli di cambiare la Costituzione, sono i problemi di cambiare la politica economica, di cambiare la politica in generale, insomma, i problemi sono problemi politici che sono nati, si sono aggravati in Italia perché all'inizio degli anni 90 sono scomparsi o praticamente crollati eh, antichi partiti, i partiti che hanno eh, caratterizzato la vita della Repubblica Italiana eh, dal 1948, anzi dal 1945 in poi. E questi partiti storici avevano lo, il ruolo di intermediare tra la società italiana e le istituzioni, il Parlamento e il Governo. Con quello che è accaduto all'inizio degli anni 90, inchieste giudiziarie che hanno investito esponenti di quasi tutti i partiti o di tutti i partiti, e quindi partiti che si sono o veramente scomparsi, del tutto scomparsi, oppure sono 
hanno cambiato completamente non solo il nome ma anche il loro modo di essere, questo ha indotto nella politica italiana uno shock eh, e è venuto meno quel ruolo di intermediazione dei partiti fra la società, fra, dei partiti fra la società e le istituzioni e da allora abbiamo avuto un periodo di grande difficoltà, eh, prima la nascita di un, un partito nuovo di centrodestra, quello guidato da Silvio Berlusconi, che è un partito, era un partito personale, cioè eh, rispondeva proprio alla persona di Silvio Berlusconi, e la trasformazione dei, dei, delle formazioni di, di sinistra e diverse elezioni in cui i risultati sono stati diversi, ma insomma la, la politica in Italia da allora non ha avuto degli orientamenti precisi, e gli elettori hanno dato il loro voto a formazioni politiche che eh, talvolta non, non mantenevano lo stesso atteggiamento nel tempo, quindi che cambiavano e c'è molto più di disorientamento negli elettori, questo credo che sia l'aspetto principale della difficoltà dell'Italia sul piano eh, politico, non sul piano costituzionale, cioè non sono in crisi le istituzioni costituzionali, ma è in crisi la politica italiana. You know, this country has uh, been uh, debating and discussing about uh, structural reforms and, and constitutional reforms for a very long time um, and nothing was done because of the Uh, you know, divisions and lack of consensus. And uh, I think this, you know, the present government was actually appointed and started uh, with the idea that one of the things that it should do, and this was a mandate, a clear one from Parliament and from the President of the Republic, was that it should uh, attack the uh, change in the Constitution Uh, not related to you know, the first part of the Constitution, but more to the, the way that the leg legislative process works. And we have a pretty unique situation in Italy, uh, where we have a, a two houses system, and the two houses have exactly the same powers, uh, which is very unusual uh, when you compare it internationally. This has led to a very convoluted and um, and complicated legislative process which takes you know a very long time for a, a law and a, whatever measure to pass through parliament and so i think it's long overdue that that we address this issue um, unfortunately the present debate uh, is very little focused on the issue uh, which is you know is this good or bad for the governance of the country Uh, do we need this? Um, um, as opposed to, you know, this has become a yes or no vote on the Prime Minister um, and, and its government. Um, and obviously this has become a very partisan type of uh, debate uh, in Italy. Um, and it's a pity because I think uh, the, the debate would, would be much more, you know, interesting and relevant to people if it was on the uh, merit uh, of the issue. Uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, internationally, this uh, is perceived as a test of whether this country uh, you know, is on a path to change or not. And uh, I think uh, one of the reasons why this country um, has been the uh, laggard uh, of Europe in terms of economic growth over the last 20 years is that uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not well functioning. Uh, now, I don't believe that the change in the Constitution is going to change uh, everything, obviously not, but I think it is, it is part of a platform of reforms uh, that are important. I think the government has started to act uh, you know, on some of those issues. Uh, labor market reform was a big piece of legislation, which was, I think, uh, very positive one and important one, which is start to bear fruits, but it's certainly not enough. And there, are, there is still a lot that needs to, to be done here. Um, but I think it's relevant because it is seen uh, internationally as, uh, you know, this is happening or it is not happening. And, uh, and, and so uh, this is why I think the vote is, uh, is important, both domestically and internationally. I, I wouldn't like to venture into 
um, you know, making guesses on the outcome because I think it's very close and, and it's difficult to say and there's still pro you know, about a, a few weeks to go before the votes and uh, many, many factors that will influence it. My question is, where is the problem? Is the problem that the citizens don't want to pay off the debt and they don't want to engage in austerity? Or is the problem there's no leadership in politics for some reasons you describe? Or is the reason that there's a structural problem which this constitutional change might fix? In your view, at what level of society do we have the problem that prevents a solution to Italy's situation? Il, il livello fondamentale a cui si pone il problema è quello dei partiti politici che appunto non svolgono più le funzioni che avevano di elaborazione del pensiero politico, delle idee politiche e dei programmi politici e quindi anche di selezione della classe di, dirigente e di, anche di orientamento dell'opinione pubblica perché la, la politica non deve soltanto seguire gli, come diciamo, gli umori delle, delle, delle persone o le paure, per esempio la paura degli immigrati, la paura de, eh, ma deve costruire idee per, fronte, per affrontare i problemi del paese e questo lo possono fare soltanto dei partiti, cioè delle organizzazioni sociali molto forti che intermediano fra le esigenze della società e la risposta delle istituzioni. Questo secondo me è il, è il, è il punto chiave. I partiti sono diventati comitati elettorali che so, a sostegno di singole persone. Questo rischio c'è molto perché è stato lo stesso Renzi, lo stesso governo all'inizio a dire che la loro scommessa era sulla riforma costituzionale, anzi Renzi disse che avrebbe lasciato la vita politica se non fosse stato approvato questo referendum. Poi si è corretto perché molti le hanno osservato che la, Costituzione non può la riforma della Costituzione non può identificarsi con un governo e quindi lui si è corretto, ha detto no, si vota sul, sul merito della riforma, però la, la, la sensazione è che molti invece ancora votino, si orientino in questo modo, anche perché capire il contenuto di questa riforma non è molto facile per il comune elettore. Una delle parole d'ordine dei, dei, dei promotori della riforma è che bisogna cambiare. Allora, cambiare è giusto quando c'è qualche cosa che non va, e, e, e però bisogna sapere che cosa cambiare e come cambiare. Invece la parola d'ordine di cambiare per cambiare ovviamente non basta. Allora chi si fida de, degli autori della riforma pensa che, che, che cambi in meglio, chi non si fida pensa che cambi in peggio. E allora la parola cambiare non, da sola non basta, anche perché si tratta della Costituzione. Allora, mentre le leggi, le politiche devono cambiare per aggiornarsi, per, per rendersi attuali quando cambiano le cose nel mondo, la Costituzione non è, non è così, la Costituzione degli Stati Uniti sta dal 1787, ci sono stati degli emendamenti, ma è ancora quella. Le Costituzioni sono fatte per durare nel tempo e per quindi governare i cambiamenti, non per cambiare continuamente anche loro. Let me step back for one second because the assumption out there is that somehow this vote means the problem, the debt problem, the problem in the banking system, the structural problems Italy faces will be resolved. And before we can answer that, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how Italians view the debt problem, the weakness of the economy, because internationally the view is this has to be fixed, it has to be fixed urgently. And maybe Italians see that differently. I think, uh, you know, Italians um, are used to the situation because this is, this is not new. Uh, the fact that Italy is a uh, highly indebted country is a reality since maybe 20, 25 years now. Um, so I, I don't think that there is probably the same sense of urgency internally. What, um, what I think is that, that 
uh, and this is a global phenomenon, I don't think it's particular to Italy, but I think that there is a growing part of the population which uh, feels left behind, which doesn't feel uh, to be taken care of by the existing traditional parties system. And this is what is fueling uh, a number of, um, you know, extreme parties or protest vote type of movements all over Europe, uh, and not only in Europe. Um, you know, the U.S. is probably not, uh, is, is, is not an exception from that standpoint. And uh, uh, this is putting strains on the European uh, construction because uh, as it happens with the Italian referendum, uh, you know, Europe is, is, is similar. We have seen it with the Brexit vote a, a few months ago. Um, oftentimes, people that are unhappy, they uh, explain their unhappiness or they put their, their finger on the wrong issue or sometimes what is not the most relevant issue. And this becomes, you know, the, res the responsible of uh, all of their problems. And... Uh, I think the risk is that um, those, uh, you know, uneasiness, uh, social tensions uh, get reflected into a more negative view about Europe. And I think for countries like Italy, uh, which have benefited greatly from the European uh, uh, Union and the European single currency over the last 20 years, I think this would be very dangerous. How much are Italians voting on whether they like the European Union or not. Eh, L'Italia ha, ha in passato ha creduto molto nell'Unione Europea, è stata uno degli stati fondatori e i politici che hanno retto lo Stato italiano negli anni 50, negli anni 60, negli anni 70 del secolo scorso hanno creduto nell'Europa e l'hanno fondata. Eh, nel 1979 è stato fatto anche un referendum consultivo, come si dice, cioè un referendum senza, un, senza effetto vincolante, in cui si chiedeva se gli italiani erano o non erano favorevoli a un governo europeo, pieno, un governo politico europeo. E risposero sì, in, gran, in grande maggioranza risposero sì. Gli italiani quindi sono sempre stati europeisti. Oggi assistiamo sia al nascere di forze politiche che non sono europeiste e anzi che tendono a polemizzare eh, con le istituzioni europee, cioè c'è un risorgere di nazionalismo, non è solo in Italia, perché anche, anche in Germania, anche in Francia abbiamo queste formazioni politiche da noi, però non abbiamo più i partiti storici, quelli che hanno fatto l'Europa, e che, e che oggi non ci sono più e quindi c'è il rischio che questa, diciamo, questa, eh, questo distacco dall'Europa e anche questa quasi avversione verso l'Europa cresca, questo è molto pericoloso perché per, per l'Italia come per, per gli altri stati del continente la prosecuzione e il rafforzamento della integrazione dell'unità è una cosa molto importante per il, per il loro futuro come è stato visto bene nel, eh, quando è cominciato il processo di integrazione. Il nazionalismo è un grave pericolo per, per l'Europa e per tutti gli stati europei. Nella storia dell'Europa il nazionalismo ha sempre significato guerra. E la guerra, l'ultima guerra è, è scoppiata proprio nel cuore dell'Europa. E, e quindi il superamento del nazionalismo, poi l'Europa era anche il luogo delle cosiddette grandi potenze, le grandi potenze coloniali, l'impero britannico, i, i francesi, e la, il superamento dei nazionalismi e degli egoismi nazionali e il puntare ad una maggiore unità continentale e mondiale è il vero progresso nato alla fine della seconda guerra mondiale, anche per merito de, 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 della nascita del, dell'ONU, delle Nazioni Unite, la dichiarazione universale dei diritti e qua gli americani sono stati i, i, i primi promotori, ricordo il ruolo di Eleanor Roosevelt nella, nella elaborazione della dichiarazione universale dei diritti dell'uomo, 
Ecco, questo oggi, oggi rischiamo di perdere questo eh, traguardo, questa, questa visione eh, che vede nella, nella collaborazione nella, in, eh, internazionale e nella integrazione dell'Europa vede il futuro e ci si chiude nei propri invece confini nazionali e questo è molto pericoloso. What do you think about the people who say the only solution is for countries to actually drop out of the euro, potentially stay in the EU, but drop out of the euro so they can devalue, restore their competitiveness, and in this way fix the problem. In your view, is that an option, or what other pathways are there to radical reform? I don't buy it. I know that there are a lot of people um, pretending this. Um, I think, uh, I think for countries in Europe uh, to stay relevant in, in a global world as well the one we're living in and, and increasingly we will live in, uh, it's just a non-starter. I think if you're Europe, uh, you have to struggle to stay relevant globally. If you're Italy, Germany or France or the UK individually, it's a non-starter. Uh, you're irrelevant and uh, if you want to be if you want your voice to be heard and if you want to stay relevant I think you have to be part of a broader you know economic uh, system and uh, I don't think that the solution is uh, you know turning back on Europe or on the single currency which doesn't mean that uh, there shouldn't be a debate in Europe about how Europe should be more uh, effective, uh, should be more liked. I think one of the issues is, you know, if I were a, a European um, official, I would ask myself, you know, why is it that Europe is so unpopular? Why is it that, you know, all over Europe you have politicians that are riding the anti-Europe wave? And as we know, politicians don't, they tend not to lead, they tend to follow public opinions. And so, if, if more and more people are riding this wave, it is because there is a wave. Uh, and, and this is probably something that at a European level, um, uh, you, you know, one should think about how to change that and, and whether, you know, certain rules that have been perceived that is excessively uh, rigid, um, you know, are motivated by, by, today's, by today's situation. There's one other force at work on this issue, which is the financial crisis. Hmm. And I think the Italian public understand the gravity and the magnitude of the problems in the financial system. You have the Italian state debt, which is enormous and very difficult to resolve, but also the banking system is not functioning properly. And so this is an additional force at work on the question of political reform. And I wonder, what's your view on, on which has to be fixed first? I am not an economist, so I don't speak as an expert of these problems. But I think that today the problems of the Italian economy are born Uh, certamente dalle, dai cambiamenti che sono intervenuti sul piano internazionale, la globalizzazione e anche dal fatto che la finanza internazionale eh, tende a prendere il sopravvento sulla politica. Eh, le stesse banche che un tempo eh, operavano per l'economia nazionale adesso sono nelle mani della finanza internazionale. Eh, io so, non sono economista, ma so che dopo la grande crisi del 1929 eh, negli Stati Uniti hanno approvato una legge per distinguere la finanza speculativa dalla, dalle, dalle banche che prestano denaro alle imprese. Oggi non c'è più questa distinzione e quindi rischiamo, di essere, eh, che, che rischiamo che la politica venga troppo condizionata dalla finanza internazionale. Da, da, un, da soggetti che non sono visibili e non, e non rispondono a nessuno. Questo è un rischio oggi, quindi occorre una politica più forte, più capace di capire come muoversi. E invece in questo momento la politica in Italia è debole.
This particular referendum, it appears, is mainly about restructuring the decision-making process of the political arena. And so if it does go through, it doesn't necessarily equal fixing the economy. Absolutely, you're totally right. I think, I think this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is one of the structural reforms that we're talking about, but there are many others. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier uh, the labor market, the, the, the labor regulations around the labor market uh, are very uh, bureaucratic and very rigid in this country. And uh, this is, you know, one of the reasons why uh, companies um, uh, hesitate before hiring in this country because uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not very, it's not a very flexible system. Um, because of the high public debt uh, and because on the pressure on, on the pressure of uh, on the deficits, um, tax rate in this country, both for individuals and for corporations, have consistently been pretty high compared to international standards, which is clearly not you know helping um, investments uh, in, in foreign investments in this country. Uh, Italy is one of the lowest recipients of foreign direct investments uh, in Europe and has been for a very long time. Uh, and uh, when you think about our, our high debt load, uh, it's easy to understand that uh, we would badly need uh, you know, foreign direct investment to substitute, uh, particularly on the infrastructure side, uh, what the government cannot do um, with uh, private capital. Um, I think uh, you know there is an issue about privatizations. Um, privatizations uh, have been talked about for many, many years. Uh, very, very little has been done. Um, what people intend with privatizations is in this country is to sell a few shares of a uh, company owned by the government and pretend that with that they've privatized it. Now that is not privatization. Privatization means changing the governance and. Uh, you know, transforming a, a publicly dominated uh, governance into a market, um, uh, you know, supported and, and organized uh, organization, which is, which is a change of culture. It's not just a question of money and, and shareholdings, but it's really a question of uh, mindset and, and mentality. And, and, and those are profound changes. Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the high pressure, the high tax rate in Italy um, uh, is something that uh, you can cure only to the extent that you're able to reduce drastically the cost of running the government. Um, so, so, you know, a massive uh, rationalization of uh, government cost that can be turned into lower tax rate for corporations and for individuals. Um, and, and so those are the type of things that uh, from a from a you know structural reform standpoint, um, as an entrepreneur, I would expect and I would hope that uh, uh, you know our, our government uh, talks about. Uh, I think there is an issue about the the legal system. Um, uh, you know, to have a dispute between two individuals or two companies uh, settled in this country it takes between two and three times uh, as much that it takes in uh, the majority of the rest of Europe. Uh, this is scary for international investors. And, and so all those things are, I think, uh, you know, very important and profound issues that, um, um, you know, I hope will get addressed and that hopefully will, uh, will change the dynamics of the Italian economy. So let me flip it the other way. If the public vote yes for the referendum, it may be seen by the rest of the world that that is an agreement to submit to austerity, to whatever the European Union at large wants to impose on Italy. But maybe that's not right either. Is it, if, we, if the Italians vote yes, does that mean that they're committing to the reforms the market expects? Or could there be disappointment there too? I think uh, there, is, there is a dynamic in Europe um, in the last uh, two or three years where um, my impression is that uh, more and more people feel that uh, central banks have done 
the heavy lifting. They've done a lot with you know, very loose monetary policy and, and with aggressive QE. And that is not enough. And uh, actually, uh, central bankers has consistently said that they can substitute themselves to what government should do. And I think what, what, what the perception today is that fiscal policy has to take, in a way, the relay of monetary policy if one wants to be effective. And, uh, and so there is a debate in, in Europe about austerity. And uh, I think Italy could play an important role uh, in that debate. Uh, unfortunately, this debate today is a bit disturbed by uh, you know, short-term um, deadlines, electoral deadlines, both in France and in Germany, uh, which makes, makes it difficult for, you know, to think of big changes. Um, but I think that um, you know, there is an issue about, uh, about whether we shouldn't have uh, you know, more forceful fiscal policy in a moment where the economy is weak, where there is still very high unemployment rate in uh, uh, Europe, and where monetary policy has shown the limits of its, ac its action. If there will be a vote for the sì, and this reform will in vigor, Non, non ci sarà a mio avviso nessun cambiamento nel, immediato nel, nella politica italiana. Il, il problema è se la politica italiana avrà più o meno mezzi per affrontare i, i problemi che deve affrontare. E io penso che ci, che ci sia bisogno di, per esempio, una maggiore coesione nazionale, vuol dire maggiore capacità di concordare, di convenire. La politica non può essere soltanto scontro, scontro mortale, diciamo, per cui una, eh, da una parte e dall'altra si sostengono posizioni completamente opposte e non, si, eh, non ci si mette mai d'accordo. Eh, que questa non è politica giusta, tanto più in un quadro come quello italiano in cui Non ci sono solo due partiti, non ci sono mai stati solo due partiti in Italia. Eh, L'Italia è politicamente più, div più divisa, non in due. E allora non si può pensare che le elezioni e la, la politica si risolvano nella vittoria di uno a esclusione di tutti gli altri, anche se questo uno non raccoglie il consenso della maggioranza della popolazione. Se fossero solo due partiti, uno ha la maggioranza e uno è in minoranza. Invece sono ormai in Italia tre o più grandi movimenti e quindi nessuno può rappresentare da solo la, la maggioranza del paese. E allora ci dovrebbe essere più capacità di incontro, di, eh, come si dice, di, di coalizione, di alleanza di, e, e invece la nostra politica tende a tradurre tutto in scontro in cui ci sia un solo vincitore, one winner. I see one scenario as a financial market person that worries me, which is if we get a no vote, then the financial markets are going to attack the Italian banking system and the European Union and, and the ECB won't permit Italy to do a bailout of those banks uh -huh. and therefore there is a possibility that the Italian government may say that we have to have what we call a bail-in. This means that the government takes the money from the citizens and this would be a violent political act and I wonder if you have any thoughts given that Italy is having a conversation about how to change its politics, how to change its constitution, how would that affect the conversation? I don't think that the reform constitutional, or yes or no, can in any way influence on the bank assets of the system, on the sources of the system. The system bank Italian system, as far as I know, è abbastanza solido, ma ha tutte diciamo, le, le debolezze derivanti dalla crisi economica 
i crediti in not, not performing, for performing loans, ecco, questi, ma su questo tema che richiede una politica bancaria a livello europeo, la riforma non incide per niente, io credo che le preoccupazioni della finanza internazionale siano legate al fatto che il governo resta o il governo se ne va, se Renzi resta o Renzi se ne va, ma se eh, che la riforma costituzionale passi o non passi non cambia nulla di questo, eh, sul, sul piano delle cose reali, dell'economia reale e d'altra parte se questo governo potrebbe benissimo continuare anche se, passa, se la riforma non passa, quindi anche se vince il no può continuare e in ogni caso se questo governo non continua c'è la possibilità di fare un altro governo e di fare delle nuove elezioni dalle quali possa venire fuori una maggioranza che sperabilmente potrebbe, possa affrontare i problemi economici dell'Italia, ma non c'è una ragione di crisi per il fatto che oggi eh, in questo governo eventualmente decida di lasciare eh, o, o, o addirittura che si debba arrivare adesso un anno prima perché le elezioni sarebbero nel 2018 quindi si tratterebbe solo di anticipare di un anno la, le, le elezioni non, non sarebbe un motivo di crisi economica quello di dover quindi non credo che ci sia proprio nessun nesso fra le sorti del sistema bancario italiano e le sorti del referendum I think that's fascinating because so many observers think that there's a direct link between the commitment to engage in constitutional reform and the ability to resolve the financial system problems. Se capisco bene, la preoccupazione non è che eh, venga un governo peggiore, ma che semplicemente che cambi il governo, che, che, che questo governo non continui. Cioè non è una eh, preoccupazione per il mantenimento dell'attuale politica italiana, è una preoccupazione per la stabilità del governo, questo mi pare di capire, ma non si può far dipendere le, le sorti del sistema economico, non, non possono eh, essere legate al fatto diciamo, occasionale che un governo con, resti o, o cada, quando per esempio manca soltanto un anno alla scadenza normale delle del, del Parlamento e delle, quindi alle nuove elezioni. La stabilità o meno del governo dipende dalla politica, dipende dal fatto che ci sia una maggioranza, che questa maggioranza sia concorde al proprio interno e resti nel tempo. Questo è quello che condiziona la stabilità, non il fatto che la Costituzione preveda un certo procedimento legislativo o un altro, un certo rapporto fra Camera dei Deputati e Senato della Repubblica. Quindi insisto sul fatto che in sé la riforma costituzionale non ha nessuna incidenza sulla capacità della politica italiana di affrontare i veri problemi che sono quelli politici. Questi, questi richiedono un'azione politica, richiedono partiti e richiedono anche eh, diciamo, forse formazione di nuove maggioranze, forse e comunque di, di formazione di indirizzi politici che sappiano affrontare i problemi. But now we've got a situation where the market is bearing down, looking very particularly at Italy and this event of the referendum. And the difficulty is if there is no change, then we're going to see further deterioration in things like the share price of major banks. And the question is, will the market now get the upper hand and compel change? Or do Italians even notice that this is happening? I mean, this is an interesting question. My personal perception, and I could be wrong, is, um, for example, after Brexit, so share price of Italian banks start falling, It's announced some effort is going to be made to find a bailout one way or another, but no money for the youth unemployed. And people start to say, wait a minute, what's in this for me? So maybe can you talk about the culture of anger around these issues? You know, the fact that, as you said, after Brexit, uh, Italian banks uh, became the culprit of uh, Uh, you know, the weak link became the, the synonym of a weak link in Europe, um, uh, I think is, is, is quite obvious. Uh, you know, banks are uh, a leverage exposure on an economy. 
And uh, if the economy doesn't do well, banks don't do well. This is always the case. And uh, it is not surprising that, um, you know, when you look at the performance of the last uh, 15 or 20 years of the Italian economy, it is not surprising that Italian banks are not in great shape. Yeah, the, the contrary would, would be surprising. And I think what happened is that after the, the, the 07, 08 financial crisis, um, uh, you know, a lot of countries, um, the US, Germany, the UK, Spain, France have injected massive amount of capital uh, or have forced banks to recapitalize uh, and to restructure themselves. And unfortunately, Italy, for a bunch of reasons, um, missed that opportunity and pretended that Italian banks were, didn't need it. They were okay, they were safe. And, uh, and that was the time when, when you could do it. When you could do it from a, from a legal standpoint, um, this was not considered to be state aid. Um, and that window closed. And uh, now it's much more difficult for governments to uh, tackle that issue. Um, but you still have that weakness uh, of financial institutions. And as, as, as you well know, uh, you know, banks are the conduit to finance the real economy. And if banks are not sound and if they are not well capitalized and if they're not well functioning, uh, that you know, translate into uh, a, a harder time to finance the, the real economy, which I think what, what is happening in Italy. And this is resented by, by people. Um, you know, the small entrepreneur uh, or uh, the person that, that wants to, uh, you know, get a mortgage to buy a house, um, uh, they are confronted with that, with that difficulty of, uh, you know, banks um, lending uh, too little uh, to the system. Now, there's always this debate, you know, if you talk to bankers, they'll tell you we lend, we don't, we don't lend more because there's not enough demand. And, and it's a chicken and egg. And, and it's true that there is not a lot of demand because the economy is not, is not growing. And, and, um, but, but I think, you know, the, the issue about the, the, the financial system and, and, and the reform of the financial system is, is a big one. And, and this is a sector that, as a lot of other sectors, has been totally changed by technology, uh, by you know consumers' habits. Uh, the way people bank today is totally different from the way people bank 20 years ago. If you asked a 30-year-old when was the last time he went into a branch of a bank, he'd say, "I've never been in the branch of a bank because I don't know what I would do there." And and this is a you know this is a totally different um, uh, environment and it is true in, in many sectors and, and so banks I think uh, have you know a huge challenge to basically change their, their, their business model uh, in this environment. Uh, we see in Britain the High Court has ruled that Brexit must go to the Parliament and now it goes to the Supreme Court in Britain. That's a kind of constitutional crisis for them. And it may be the simultaneous constitutional questions in big economies like the US, the UK, and Italy that becomes a, a magnifier. So it's not your fault that the timing is like this, but it may affect uh, the outcome. Io penso che i cosiddetti mercati internazionali hanno sempre paura dell'incertezza, vorrebbero sapere sempre che tutto, che tutto, tutto è stabile, tutto non, non cambia, anche, anche la politica, ma in democrazia i cambiamenti, sono, i cambiamenti politici sono sempre possibili e, e d'altra parte io, io credo che in Italia non, non ci sarà nessuna crisi costituzionale, sia che vinca il sì, sia che vinca il no, mentre la crisi costituzionale di Gran Bretagna è dovuta al fatto che c'è stato un referendum che ha inciso su una questione fondamentale dei rapporti internazionali, se la Gran Bretagna sta dentro o sta fuori l'Unione Europea. In Italia non c'è nessuna crisi di questo genere, c'è una Costituzione che funziona, ci sono dei partiti deboli, delle forze politiche deboli, che devono trovare la loro, la loro capacità di governare e anche di andare d'accordo, di trovare i punti di unità e, trovare, e affrontare i problemi veri, che sono appunto quelli 
oltre alla, alla, a quelli che ha citato, le migrazioni, il debito pubblico, eh, basta passare al tema delle disuguaglianze molto forti anche negli Stati Uniti, ma nel, in Italia le disuguaglianze fra, fra strati sociali sono molto cresciute in questi anni. Well, I think, you know, growing inequalities is again a global phenomenon. I think it's, uh, it's measured and, and it has uh, become worse uh, over the last 15-20 years. Um, and I think this is again a major you know, political issue for uh, governments. And uh, um, to be aware of that you know, growing discontent, which is, which is not ideological. Uh, it's the growing discontent because your purchasing power uh, decreases because uh, your ability to find jobs or for your kids to find jobs decreases uh, because today if you li live in a large metropolitan area um, you know it is very challenging to uh, have uh, you know the possibility of a decent life from an economic standpoint Uh, when you match, you know, the cost of living uh, in terms of, you know, housing and transportation and all that with, uh, you know, salaries, particularly uh, entry-level salaries uh, for, for young people. Um, and so I, I think this is a, this is a major uh, societal issue, which is, I think, a global phenomenon. And this is probably one of the main reasons why we have a crisis of the traditional political parties and, and, and traditional politics. And uh, um, I think it's um, very tough to be a politician in today's world. It's, uh, it's, it's really challenging. It seems to me the appetite of the Italian public for change is very high. They seem to understand that significant change is required. But what is unclear is the direction <laughs> And one of the issues that is related to the referendum is immigration. And I wonder whether we see a similar pattern in Italy where people become fearful of immigration from a financial perspective. They say there's not enough money to fix my problems. Now we have new people arrive. Or does it get the Italian public to say, actually, now we really need to change in order to become a more open and accommodating society. Do you, do you think that this separate issue will influence the appetite for change? In, eh, in questa materia l'immigrazione non ha niente a che fare. I problemi della immigrazione sono problemi che in parte preoccupano l'Italia perché c'è un forte afflusso migratorio verso l'Italia, non c'è collaborazione in Europa su questo tema, ma la riforma costituzionale non c'entra nulla praticamente con questo tema e quindi quando la gente pensa a che cosa si dovrebbe cambiare, pensa alle, alle politiche, ma soprattutto la politica, una politica che, che dia più lavoro, quello che manca oggi è il lavoro, che sistemi di finanze dello Stato, oggi abbiamo in Italia un debito pubblico molto elevato che non diminuisce. Questi sono i problemi su cui bisognerebbe incidere. Da questo punto di vista la riforma costituzionale non cambia niente direttamente e i suoi promotori sostengono che la riforma costituzionale dovrebbe consentire di decidere meglio o di decidere di più. In quelli che avversano la riforma pensano invece che questa riforma non consente di decidere meglio e eventualmente anzi peggiora il modo in cui le decisioni politiche vengono prese. You know, as, as normally it happens in history when you have uh, economic crisis and you have hardships and you have, um, you know, people um, uh, finding it difficult to find jobs, Uh, one of the you know, most natural reactions is to retrench and, and is the fear of the other and the fear of the unknown and the fear of somebody that is coming into your system and basically eating your lunch. And this is something which, which 
which has always been the case. And, and I think in, in this juncture, it's clearly becoming a, 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 you know, a, a major issue. I think uh, this is one of the themes in which Europe has not been sufficiently present. Basically, you know, the tackling of uh, this huge wave of immigration from North Africa that we're witnessing in the, in the last uh, you know, years now um, has been basically left to the single countries. And this is a way of saying Europe doesn't exist from that standpoint. And if, if, if one believes in Europe, well, Europe should stand up and have a common way to deal with those issues, particularly because from a geographic standpoint, you have countries that are uh, you know, in the first line and countries that are behind. And, and typically, you know, Italy was one of those countries where immigrants would come uh, first and then they would pass through and go in other countries uh, in Europe. Now, what other countries in Europe are doing today is they're, they're, they're making it more difficult for immigrants to uh, you know, exit from, from Italy, which makes it a huge challenge for Italy because the ability of a country to absorb over a short period of time a large number of immigrants is, 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 is limited. And, uh, and this creates social tensions and this creates um, you know, fuel for those um, demagogic, uh, you know, answers and movements that, that basically leverage on that fear uh, to, uh, to try to present solutions which are not always, you know, the solutions to the problem, but at least they speak to uh, a, a very, uh, you know, something that, that is of daily experience to a lot of people. So as a final comment, my impression from my visit to Italy is that uh, the polls are right. A very high percentage of the public want to vote on want this issue. Vote. They want to. And I think some of the polls show as high as 90% of the public wants to vote on the referendum. But most people don't know how they're going to vote because they don't understand it. And I'm incredibly grateful to you and our viewers would be so grateful to you for explaining this with such great clarity. Eh, ma questo in parte eh, questo fatto della incertezza delle persone che non sanno come votare dipende dalla complessità dell'argomento e dal fatto che si è voluto fare una riforma che ha diversi oggetti. Per esempio, non ne abbiamo parlato, ma um, i rapporti fra stato e regioni, stato centrale e, e, e regioni, diversi oggetti e, e quindi non va bene fare un referendum su questo, si dovrebbe eh, decidere singole questioni, non pacchetti di questioni. You know, this vote is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to change things and it's an opportunity to change to choose between uh, change and conservatism. And uh, for that reason, uh, even though the reform is not a perfect one, and if you look into and if you talk to experts uh, they have all sort of issues about, you know, how it was designed. And I'm not an expert, but I understand some of those issues. And uh, I could be sympathetic, but at the end of the day, you have to decide, you know, yes or no. Uh, and I think the reasons for the yes are, are, are much, um, you know, more um, conclusive and convincing than, than for the no. That being said, um, I think that it is a mistake to, uh, to basically do terrorism and saying it's like Brexit. You know, people said, you know, if, if Brexit wins, it's going to be the end of the world for the UK. I, I think this is much too exaggerated as I think it would be in Italy. So I think it'd be, I think a yes vote would be, would be an encouragement in, in this direction. Um, I think it'd be a stimulus uh, uh, and I hope it'd be taken that way by the government to do more. Um, and no vote, I think, would create short-term uncertainty. Um, and, you know, I think uh, it would mean that uh, for, f you know, once again, uh, somebody will have tried to change things and will not have been successful, which which is not good because people from the outside, you know, will have a hard time believing next time that you'll tell them that there is, you know, a, a, a change agenda to believe in it. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure. I thank Professor Onida 
and Rodolfo de Benedetti have done an amazing job helping us understand a very complicated referendum, the one that's being presented to the Italian public on December the 4th. I have to say for myself, I came away with the impression that if the Italian public vote no, that does not mean that they are against fixing the debt problem or fixing the banking sector problem, or even that they're against the European Union. It just means that they don't like this particular set of provisions, which are, as we've heard, very, very complex. Similarly, if they vote yes, I don't think it means that everything is solved. We still have a debt problem, a banking sector financial problem, and a troubled relationship with the European Union, given the amount of pain that the Italian public are experiencing from the economy. What seems clear is that the financial markets globally think that a yes vote is something to rally on, to buy markets on, and a no vote is something to sell. And I suspect that this is not a correct interpretation of the vote either way, but we need to be prepared for financial market reactions either way.